Although Sweden began to rebuild its air force in the face of continental threats in the late 1930s, its domestic industry didn't have enough designers and aircraft engineers to create everything it needed to be self-sufficient. The Air Force's initial policy was therefore to focus Swedish design teams on bombers while purchasing monoplane fighters from the US. But from May 1940, obtaining any aircraft at all from foreign suppliers became impossible, as every country wanted all of its domestic production for itself. So, in November 1940, the Air Board agreed with Saab that they should start developing a fighter aircraft. As it happens, the last aircraft designed by Asger, one of Saab's precursor organisations in 1939, had been a monoplane fighter, powered by a Bristol Taurus. Contemporary sketches show this driving contra-rotating propellers, but some historians suggest that a pusher concept with twin booms was also considered. I've not come across any pictures of this, but when the new L-21 project was presented to the Air Force by Frid Wanström in April 1941, the power plant was a Swedish-built version of the Dame Levens DB605B of 1475 horsepower, unconventionally mounted in the rear, driving a pusher propeller. The tail unit was supported by twin booms, which also housed the main undercarriage. 13.2mm machine guns were sighted in the front part of the booms. Otherwise, the armament was concentrated in the fuselage nose, which housed one 20mm cannon and two more 13.2mm machine guns. Amongst other technical innovations, the aircraft was the first in Sweden to have a nose wheel undercarriage. As you might expect, there were initially quite a few technical uncertainties in the project, such as how the engine could be cooled on the ground as there was no propeller slipstream. Similarly, the team wondered about the effect on control characteristics on the ground with the rudders outside the propeller slipstream. The nose wheel undercarriage was untested and Sweden's airfields were grass, so there were reasonable questions about how durable it might be. An innovative gunpowder-propelled ejector seat was also fitted, but the team needed to prove to the airboard that it could provide the pilot with sufficient clearance of the propeller in the event of a bailout. The uncertainties prevailed for some time, and in October 1941 the airboard stopped the initial project work ordered in April. Instead, Saab was instructed to start project work on a more conventional backup design. The L-23 is an interesting looking fighter that looks rather like a BF-109 from the leading edge of the wing forward, but from there backwards closely resembles the first versions of the P-51 Mustang. It was also powered by a Ben 605, and it had a 20mm cannon firing through the propeller hub as well, paired with two 13.2mm machine guns in each wing. The pilot was protected forward and back by armour, and the fuel tank was placed behind the pilot and also protected with armour. Because the L-23 had 20% greater moment of inertia around the longitudinal axis, and 15% greater around the vertical axis, the L-23 actually had significantly worse manoeuvrability than was forecast for the L-21. The pusher arrangement of the L-21 also meant that it was likely to be more accurate, and there was more space if the battery was to be changed. Visibility, takeoff and landing characteristics and pilot safety were all superior, and Saab emphasised that the significant advantages shown in the L-21 just couldn't be achieved with the L-23. Eventually, Saab managed to convince the Air Board of the advantages of the L-21 solution, and in November, Saab duly received a final go-ahead for the L-21. A mock-up was approved on the 8th of July 1941, and on the 5th of December 41, the project was handed over to the design office in Linkoping for materialisation. Chief of the design office was A.J. Anderson, who had been a key figure at Svenska and then worked with Booker in Germany for some years before returning home. Hard work enabled the technical problems to eventually be solved. Ground cooling was arranged by installation in the inner wing of two cooling fans driven by the engine via a mechanical gearbox. The fans rotated at 13,500 RPM when the engine RPM was just 1,800. The fans were automatically disconnected in flight. But the overheating issues were never resolved and engines of production fighters would constantly overheat on the ground unless their taxiing was very carefully managed. The ejector seat, the first of its kind at the time, was a major developmental task. Initial ground tests with a wooden dummy were followed by flight tests using a Saab 17 in February 1944. The tests were very promising, and the first J-21 prototype was equipped with an ejector seat from its first flight, prior to the testing being completed. In fact, in August 1946, 
Junior Lieutenant Bengd Johansson abandoned his damaged Saab at an altitude of about 2,000 metres, becoming the first person in the world to eject from a production combat aircraft. He landed safely in the Baltic, and he was picked up by a destroyer. In fact, there were 25 subsequent ejections from the J-21, and 23 of them were successful, proving the designer's confidence was not misplaced. The new tricycle undercarriage required another major development effort. To validate estimates made on the geometry, nose wheel shimmery, and so on, a test rig with the same mass as the aircraft was built and towed behind a car under various conditions. The next step was the conversion of an SK-14, otherwise known as a North American NA-16-4M trainer, to a tricycle configuration. These tests were successful, and they removed all remaining doubts about the idea. The central nacelle was strongly built, with welded steel elements to take flight and mounting loads, particularly where the tail booms joined to the wing. In an interesting historical echo of Swedish cars to come, a robust crash and armour cell for the pilot was deliberately developed. 5mm and 8mm armour plates were fitted to protect the pilot and the fuel tank, which was placed aft of the cockpit. The J-21 was not a pure monocoque all-metal aircraft. Rather, it used a primary structural frame of steel tubing with plywood or plywood-type skinning in places, and conventional metal skinning only in the tail booms and the wing. The forward nose was aluminium framed, as were the tail booms. This mixed material approach was common in countries with limited access to strategic aluminium supplies, or to speed up production using skilled woodworkers. To achieve the high speed required for the new fighter, a new wing profile had to be developed in order to reduce drag and to maintain laminar flow over as much of the wing area as possible without losing too much lift. The wing profile was developed at Saab and extensively tested in the wind tunnels at the Aeronautical Research Establishment and the Royal Institute of Technology, both in Stockholm. It proved very successful, while the interference drag of the tail booms was considerably less than that of conventional engine nacelles. For reference, it was a two-spar wing with an aluminium leading edge and plywood trailing edges. The main landing gear legs retracted rearwards into the tail booms, which were structural members sized to take landing loads and gear loads as well as tailplane loads. That arrangement affected the boom's cross-section, stiffness and local reinforcement around the wheel wells. The flight testing confirmed early estimates by giving a top speed of about 15.5 miles an hour or 25 kilometres an hour higher than the guaranteed speed Saab had given the Ministry. The Saab 21 was a very unconventional aircraft by any standard, and the first flight in 1943 could well have been a disaster. The aerodynamicists had for some reason come to the conclusion that the takeoff should take place with full flap angle. Following wind tunnel tests, this should have given the shortest possible takeoff distance. The Saab chief test pilot, Klaus Smith, voiced some doubts, but eventually the Air Force test pilots consulted also gave in. At the expected point of rotation, nothing therefore happened, and it was too late to stop. Saab's grass aerodrome was very short and surrounded by a road and a low fence. Instead of stopping, the pilot built up speed as much as possible. The aircraft touched the road and tore down the fence, but it was airborne. The life of the test pilot is never easy. Unfortunately, the undercarriage was damaged and it could now not be retracted, so flight characteristics couldn't be checked out. For landing, the larger airfield at Malmslat was chosen. It was a smooth landing, however, the pilot discovered that there was no wheel braking due to the damage caused at takeoff. He suddenly recalled that he had an anti-spin parachute installed and he released it, thus inventing the braking parachute. At this moment the main undercarriage started to collapse, causing the propeller tips to function as a very effective brake, and collision with the surrounding forest could therefore be avoided. Damage actually proved to be limited and the aircraft was repaired quickly. Testing wasn't entirely without incident though. In one case when doing a dive test at 540 km an hour, the prototype aircraft suddenly pitched up and the pilot lost control. The canopy also fell off for good measure. Fortunately, he was somehow able to level off and land the aircraft. The Saab J-21A entered Swedish service in the closing months of 1945. It was obviously an unusual fighter, but the arrangement gave the pilot a very clear forward view and a very stable firing platform. His position immediately behind the guns made aiming easy, and the three nose guns gave a very concentrated burst of fire. 
At 1,500 feet, or 450 metres of range, the dispersion was less than 2 feet. The boom-mounted weapons were harmonised at 200 metres, or 720 feet, and their spread was 6 foot 6 inches, or 2 metres. The aircraft's tricycle undercarriage was still a novelty in Europe at the time, but ground handling was generally praised. Pilots liked the exceptionally small turning radius, good stall characteristics once airborne, and general stability. In service, however, pilots discovered that the distinctive twin-boom layout imposed a high moment of inertia. The aircraft could climb well and it felt steady in the air, but its roll response was heavy and it didn't excel in close-in dogfighting. It was workable as a fighter, but it didn't offer the agile combat handling of newer designs arriving just after the war. Since in 1945 the Swedish Air Force was able to finally acquire American P-51D Mustangs, known as the J-26 in Sweden, there were plenty of opportunities to compare the two fighters. Due to its much more powerful supercharged engine and its modern aerodynamics, the Mustang not unexpectedly proved superior in turning performance and in climb. It was 40 miles an hour faster at 440 miles an hour or so, and it climbed about 15% faster to a higher ceiling. Even so, better visibility and firepower concentration in the J-21 could be decisive in mock combat when it was combined with individual pilot skill. Special tactics adapted to the qualities of the aircraft were also developed, and the tight turning and favourable stall characteristics could be used to advantage in a dogfight. An effective manoeuvre was to climb vertically and wait until the pursuing fighter stalled. After that, the J-21 pilot could wheel over and dive on him. Even so, these were coping mechanisms rather than the characteristics of a world-beating fighter. As a result, the Saab J-21A3, later redesignated A-21A, was developed in the immediate post-war years as a purpose-built ground attack and fighter bomber variant. Work began in 1946 and the first A3s entered production from 1947. Deliveries continued through 1949. Structurally, the A3 remained the familiar J-21 airframe, but its equipment and mission fit were revised for attack work. Central to the new version was a sophisticated bomb site based on Saab's own BT series, Mechanical Toss or Shallow Dive Bombing Computer, design of which had begun in the early 1940s. It was conceived in-house by Saab engineers, building on earlier Scania ideas to allow attacks from a shallower dive or a short toss manoeuvre so that the aircraft could release ordnance with less exposure to flak and fighters, and then pull away safely. As he ran in, the pilot fed the BT-9 with his intended airspeed and release altitude, selected toss or dive angle and the target aim point as seen through his sight. The device calculated the correct release point for the chosen manoeuvre. It compensated for aircraft attitude during the final approach and provided the pilot with a ranging and aiming cue so that bombs or rockets would follow the computed ballistic trajectory. Accuracy in practice depended strongly on release parameters, altitude, airspeed, the dive or toss angle, the wind and the quality of target tracking during the aiming run, so performance for a low-level tactical toss would be different from a higher shallow dive run. Contemporary Swedish commentary therefore describes the BT-9 as significantly improving hit probability for a shallow dive or toss profile. In operational terms, it transformed the A3 strike capability though. It let the pilot use moderate approach altitudes, commence the final toss or shallow dive only late in the run to reduce exposure time, and still obtain useful accuracy against point and light area targets. The wings of the attack version were fitted with underwing pylons capable of carrying bombs and rocket rails. The A3 could be equipped with a range of ordnance. It could take bombs between 50 and 500 kilograms. Rocket barrages were standard when suppression of ground targets was required. To increase its punch, some A3s trialled auxiliary gun pods and heavier 57mm Bofors cannon installations in trials. Operational changes also addressed endurance and takeoff performance under load. The attack blocks routinely used larger 400 litre drop tanks to extend range on strike missions, and some aircraft were trialled with RATO assistance to shorten takeoff runs when laden with weapons. In service, the type proved well suited to the Swedish doctrinal tasks of the late 1940s. Its stability and pilot visibility made it an effective gun and bomb platform, while the rugged undercarriage and reinforced structure tolerated the rigours of dispersed operations and or steer fields. But despite fitting well into Sweden's defensive doctrine, the J-21A remained in frontline service for only a few years. The Swedish Air Force moved rapidly into the jet age with the Vampire and then the home-built J-29 Tunan. By 1951, the propeller-driven J-21A 
had been withdrawn from fighter units, with a handful continuing briefly in second-line duties. In the end, the J-21A was a transitional aircraft. It was modern in appearance and innovative in layout, and it was valuable for training a generation of Swedish pilots and engineers, but it was overtaken almost immediately by the arrival of jet propulsion. Altogether, a total of 302 21s were delivered, including 59 basic fighters, 124 J-21A-2s with modified inner wing flaps and cooling, and 119 of the A-3 attack variants. It was a success story for the local industry, and its unique layout also made it ideal for conversion into a jet fighter. But that is another story. I hope you've enjoyed the video. Thanks so much for watching.